isn't it? <laughs> let's turn it around. Let's make it work. All right. So uh, let's start with, with uh, and, we'll, and we'll have room for questions at the end for you guys. <laughs> so she was like, we should have like music bringing us up. <laughs> so let's start, uh, Dan, with, uh, with uh, um, the origin idea for this. There was not, you know, there's not like in the history of TV, there's not a whole lot of sitcoms based around cops. I mean, Barney Miller, kind of the, right. the most famous one. How did you come up with this idea and how did you get it started? Um, well, I created it with uh, Mike Shore, who uh, also created Parks and Rec. I don't know if anyone here is a fan. Um, and Mike had, uh, um, and so Mike and I had worked on Parks and Rec. Actually, Chelsea was a writer at Parks and Rec for a couple of years. Kind of thought that would get a woo. No applause. No applause. No. 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 Um, and uh, we decided we wanted to create a show together, and we wanted to uh, set it in a world um, where you could really have all sorts of different characters interacting, both as the regular cast, and they would interact with all sorts of interesting people. And so what we really liked about the police, and especially the police in Brooklyn, was if you look at uh, uh, New York City Police Department, it's just, it's relatively diverse, and it's made up of people who look and, and have, who, <laughs> sorry, we had a lot of barbecue last night in Austin, and <laughs> my brain is now addled Barbie. in brisket. <laughs> Brisket. Um, Giggle pig. <laughs> what did you say? Giggle pig. Giggle, no, Giggle pig. pig. It's a show reference. Woo! Um, no, so we really liked the idea that we could get, um, it, it meant that we could cast the funniest people. We could just sort of have a, a blind audition. If you do a family, you sort of choose where your family is and what they look like, and that limits who you can have in your family. And if you do a show set in a workplace, you can really open it up. And then by putting that workplace in Brooklyn, we felt like Brooklyn is such an interesting place right now where you have kind of old world Brooklyn, um, whether that's like you know Ukrainian, a Ukrainian neighborhood or like a Hasidic neighborhood, and then right next door you have hipsters moving in and you have stroller moms. And within the actual boundaries of the precinct, the 99 isn't a real precinct. This is not a documentary. <laughs> But it follows the borders of, uh, I think, the 7-8. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But um, and in, within that precinct, there's Prospect Park, which is very much like Central Park. Um, and then there's also a warehouse district. And there are super fancy uh, brownstones with, that celebrities live in. So like you, I just kind of felt like you, could, you had a sampling of the whole world. That's great. So, and, and when it comes to casting, you were talking about you can't pick your family. Wouldn't that be awesome if you could, but you can't. So when you were making these core characters, who did, who did you uh, dream up first, and, and how did that come about, too? Um, well... <laughs> I was just thinking it would be funny if you started with Scully. Yeah. <laughs> we knew Scully had to be in it, and then that led to Hitchcock. Then you go to Andy Samberg. And for two years, we pitched Scully and Hitchcock. <laughs> And somebody was like, you know what, maybe there should be other characters. Um, no, we, we, um, we started with, with Andy's character. We didn't have, Andy wasn't on board at that, at that time. He wasn't not on board. It wasn't, <laughs> it's like, it's like, I will never work with them. He just didn't know about it. Once he knew about it, he was on board. Why am I so defensive about Andy's participation? <laughs> What are, have you guys heard any? Does Andy not like me? You're spiraling. You're spiraling. This yeah. is really loud. It feels too much brisket. Um, no. So uh, we started with that character, and um, we had this like very. Mike and I would get together every morning before Parks and Rec started, and we would sort of pitch on the character and the world and stuff. And we had this very long, detailed list of characteristics. And then when we finally did pitch it to Andy, he was like, "Oh, Comedy McNulty from The Wire." <laughs> Good show, The Wire. Woo! Yes. None of us worked on it. You don't have to cheer. <laughs> um, and so, as a result, like, so that was sort of the, the, the starting point. And then um, we wanted there to be, and then we, we worked with um, this amazing casting director, Allison Jones. There was a great profile of her in The New Yorker, which I totally recommend reading. She's really interesting, and she casts all of Judd Apatow's movies, and she cast um, The Office and curb your enthusiasm, and she kind of finds all these interesting people, and she really helped us populate the world. 
And we knew early on we wanted a captain for him to butt heads against, and we wanted the captain to have an interesting journey that got him to where he was, and that's sort of how we came up with Holt and the idea that he was, that he was gay and out, um, and that that had meant, it was, in our first conception, that had meant that he had been sort of um, oppressed, that's the wrong word, but had been like put down by the NYPD for coming out in the 80s and had been continuously. And we have a friend that Mike and I went to college with who's an NYPD officer and he was like, actually in the 90s he would have been brought forward um, and sort of been made the face of the NYPD. And we thought that was interesting and that he would also hate that. All he wanted to do was be a cop. And so that made for this kind of interesting journey. Um, and then you know, we wanted a real actor who had a lot of gravitas, and Allison Jones suggested Andre Brower, and obviously he's pretty he's good. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, he really is perfect. I mean, as yeah. the straight man, it's just it's too. Funny. And, he, and you know, he's actually funny in real life. I'm guessing, yeah. right, guys? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, he is. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like I think he's not, but he is. And then it was just we also we met with we we wanted Chelsea to be on the show because we worked with her in the room, and. And we were like, oh, she should be on TV. <laughs> so, well, let's, let's start there then. Thank you for doing that for me. <laughs> you owe me. Yeah. So, well, let's go. Let's go. I mean, because I, I thought it would be something like, uh, you know, Andy, obviously. Right. And then, you know, Melissa, because you have to have the partner. Right. Oh, yeah, totally. And then, at the, and then, at, and this, well, there's a specific correct answer you wanted. Yeah. Well, no, no. I, at, and I'm going to ask him until he gives it to me. No, well, but no, I just but think, it, I just well, think at the well, end. But right? that is, uh, that is interesting. That would be, but. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm having. <laughs> you just fell asleep right now. <laughs> Brisket. Which, like a Google Fiber goes into my brain, and I'm, I can talk. Um, we knew, obviously, that we wanted to have a funny, uh, beautiful, challenging woman in the precinct who would be a counterpart to, to Andy. But also, we, didn't, we, we felt like there was a pitfall, potentially, in making a will-they-won't-they they, the founding principle of the show. And so I think we really, it was always our intention, and we obviously chose two attractive people who are the same age, and from the very beginning, we had them have flirty banter and stuff like that, but we really tried to let the chemistry develop on its own and the stories to, to move towards a will-they-won't-they they, as opposed to starting it. So that's why I think sort of from the, the founding premise was really this kind of renegade cop and a, and a like a by-the-book captain. Yeah. Well, we can circle back to, to that, because uh, there's definitely some questions about choosing relationships in, in comedy, and I know that some people don't think that's a good idea, other people are for that, but for, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a plot I point. I hope everyone thinks it's a good um, idea. Larry, Larry David's not a fan of that, so that's, As you know. no hugging, no learning, no relationships, that kind of thing. Well, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, he knows what he's doing, so it's hard to argue with him. He's one of the best. Yeah. I wish he had told us that before we had the show. Well, no, well... Since we're on it, let's just stay with it because you had you have a you have a situation where you have a lot of people who are kind of coupled up in the show, and obviously on Parks and Recreation, they're not afraid to do that as well. So, right. it, what what what's the take as far as? Like, well, I do. I mean, I think there are different like the genre of sitcoms. I don't want to say is evolving because that implies that there's some like that it's getting better, and I'm not saying that, but I think that the way people watch shows now is very different. Um, and that, it, to some extent, also influences how much arc there can be in a show and how much your audience wants the characters to learn and change. I think that, you know, when Seinfeld was on, obviously it's an amazing, perfect show. You'd watch it once a week. You wouldn't binge watch it. You wouldn't save five of them on your DVR. And it was like you dropped back into the world and you'd see them and it was fun to see Kramer acting like Kramer and Seinfeld acting like Seinfeld and George acting like George. I know all of their names. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, the, and Veep also. <laughs> no, Elaine, come on, she's amazing. National treasure for reals. But, um, but I think now audiences want to see, see that growth. And I think if you were to watch our show, if you were to DVR our show and watch it and Jake made the exact same mistake 
every episode, I think you'd, you'd stop watching. I mean, the, the converse of that is that I think you can overcorrect and you can make it so that people just learn everything and then they've learned themselves out of comedy. And that's tough. I mean, that's the thing we fight in the room. It's like, what is a nuance on something we've done? What is doing it again, which is bad? And what is like, oh, that character can never do that again, but now they'll never be funny again. I mean, in real life, people don't change that much. At least my wife doesn't. <laughs> well, is there, is there a danger? <laughs> it's like a Henny Young. I think this is being recorded, by the way. She's going to see this. Um, <laughs> Is, the, is there a danger in bringing two characters together? Uh, and then, because you know, we had the tension of those two trying to get together for the f first season. Yeah, clearly one of them has this, to die. We had this Gina Boyle thing last year. Yeah, no, no, it, there is, I, I think there is a danger. I think it is really, uh, it's scary. And like, that's what the writer's room is working on right now is how to make that funny and not to, um, and not to make it feel stale, and to be able to continue to mine comedy from those two characters and their interaction. And I think one thing that often happens is when the will they, won't they is the starting point of, of a series, although the best example of this not being the case is Cheers, and that's the most ex famous example, so put Cheers aside. <laughs> but there are times where you basically imply that your two leads are star-crossed lovers. And if you imply that they're star-crossed, I think it can be difficult because when you put them together, it begins to feel like they can't argue and they can't have hiccups and... I guess you haven't seen my relationship. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of arguing, hiccups. <laughs> Just kidding, we're great. <laughs> I'm gonna stop trying to interject. No, interject. <laughs> I'm really curious about your relationship. I think we all are. But... Uh, so I think it's establishing a pattern early on that, that, that they can be together or not together. I don't know what happens. But that either way, it'll continue to be funny. It's not like they'll, they're together now and they can't argue and they're just a unit, you know? And Melissa, did you know that this was the direction it was going to go into from season one or, in, or not? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> she had more brisket than yeah. I did. <laughs> I had a lot of brisket last night. Um... <laughs> I did not, I mean, I knew that potentially it was always going to go there, um, possibly, when we first started. Um, but it was just, you know, like every script you get and it moving a little forward. And, and I really, I should not talk anymore. <laughs> oh. Well, let's, let's keep going, though. Uh, <laughs> so as you, as... But I didn't know, I didn't know, like, what, and they didn't either, like, you know, we tried to play it by ear. We tried to make it, uh, we tried to keep our finger on the pulse, <laughs> keep the thermometer in the mouth. <laughs> What's the proper, finger on the pulse. Go Why would on the, the thermometer be in the mouth? Exactly. <laughs> and then, and, but, as we, but as we end here, as you saw the finale, I mean, you've brought them to an interesting place. I mean, they're clearly now going to be a thing, right? So. I as, mean, I, yeah, we're not, there's, there, uh, that cleared things up. No, thank you. And I, I'd like to see that written out in a transcript. A <laughs> yuggada, uh, yuggada, yuggada. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, there's, the first episode will not be what we call a yank. It's not like we're going to ignore what happened, but I don't think, my, my only point is that it's not smooth sailing from here on out. You know, they have to, they work together, they're different personalities, they kissed in a moment of trauma and now they have to figure out sort of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And how do you, when, when you put things together, like when did you guys come up with the idea that uh, the Gina and Boyle thing would happen? <laughs> there is so much on stage chemistry between the two of them. <laughs> it was like, when won't it happen? <laughs> no, um, well, Gina was always so hilariously cruel to Charles. And I don't remember, it was a few weeks beforehand, but it was immediately our favorite part of that finale. I mean, it was just so f fun to think of them waking up and sleeping together. And then we also knew, as soon as it was pitched, it was like, oh, and then in the premiere, they'll also wake up in bed screaming. And then we had, a, <laughs> then for a while it was gonna end every episode. <laughs> we we're like, we can't do that. Um, 
And so, and then it was, it was our, our, and with that also like, we wanted to make it clear they're not star-crossed lovers that, you know, it, we weren't gonna try and like, squeeze out a, a loving, healthy adult relationship. <laughs> um, and so, but the, I, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and uh, Chelsea, when we talked about the casting early on, um, you, it's got to be the best job. I mean, because, like, what does Gina do? I genuinely do a lot of texting. <laughs> I swapped my real phone in for the prop phone. Because <laughs> our computers are not active, at least not yet. <laughs> no I get internet on the computers because computer. apparently the office they had computers that weren't active and then they eventually put them on and everyone just did online shopping all day <laughs> so that's what I'm hoping we're working towards um, but yeah uh, no it's a it is a great job and I, I loved it because she's eccentric and rather than um, <laughs> I don't know why I used to get like a lot of auditions for things that were mean and she has that mean streak at times, but I think she's also like silly and eccentric and I like being able to have more layers than just like a mean girl or a pretty sweet girl. Like I feel like there's two roles in Hollywood. <laughs> and so it's fun to be someone who's marching to the beat of their own drummer, so to speak. A lot of colloquialisms up here today. <laughs> Well, when, you, when the show gets put together, and that's kind of what I was getting, when you're, when you're building this from scratch and you're creating these characters that are not your family, and you obviously Amy and Jake and Holt are, are there, and, and Gina seems like uh, you know, it's, some, it's a character that you can just, because Chelsea's so funny, you can throw her in there and say, okay, we'll just let her write her own lines, or we'll write her lines, and, and she just has to be. I right. write all my own lines. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Is that true? No. What's crazy no, is... Like, many very funny ones she does. Yes. But what's crazy is that the scripts, like, sometimes a line is written, like, for... I always think of the one where it's like, I go, like, my dream is to just answer the phone like, uh-huh, or something. That was the line, right? And it's yeah. like, it looks, like, so weird written, but it, it, sometimes the lines look like something that would be improvised when you read it, and, like, they totally make sense. But they look so... Um, Garbage. <laughs> just, kidding. just kidding. Just kidding. But they're written very much in the spirit of the characters, so they, you can't imagine that it was written, but it is. Right. Yeah. How, much, how much improvising is done? Um, well, it, it, whatever it takes to overcome the garbage. <laughs> so quite a bit. It's like, uh, I think being an actor on our show is like, Living mm. underneath a giant pile of mucking crap. through a, a landfill of words, climbing, Magic. Climbing, climbing out of a shit pile. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's, there's, uh, no, no. no. Um, well, I was going to say that when we pitched the show and we pitched the character of Gina Linetti, which sounds a little like Chelsea Peretti, um, like eighty-seven percent of the pitches for the character were just things that had happened in our room. Like there was a pie co pie tasting contest. The room at Parks and Rec. The rooms at Parks and Rec. Sorry, room. not like our room. <laughs> <laughs> we share a pied a terre. <laughs> <laughs> We're both in loving relationships, but they're cool with it. It's a very it's a creative space. It's 2015, you guys. What's your problem? Um, but <laughs> so uh, uh, how much is improvised? Was the question. Yeah. Um, you should really get us to stick to the questions more. Um, now it's my fault. I would say, if I had to give it a percentage, 17. All right, good. That's good. But I would say that basically what happens is we write all the scenes. <laughs> That's such, like the most obvious things. In a thing we call a script. And then they say the lines. It's, no, so we do the scenes a bunch of times. We do the scenes by the setup that we have which we took from the office and Parks and Rec, is we use two cameras at the same time, which allows us to catch any improvisations. So that if you do, traditional shooting would be, one camera would be on you, and then you'd be saying your lines might be over my head so you could see you, and then if I said something hilarious, I'd have to remember it or the script supervisor would write it down, and then you'd turn it around and come back at me, and then I'd say all of the things, the amazing things that I had thought of that were amazing because I thought of them, and then, and they wouldn't feel as natural necessarily. But like this, um, the way we do it, we do five or six takes scripted, and then we do what's called a fun run. And the fun run is they're allowed to, the actors are allowed to sort of play uh, 
they're let off the leash, so to speak. It's called a fun run? It's called a fun run. Doesn't that sound magical? <laughs> Doesn't it sound like something like a dictator would call a forced march? Yes. Well, now the fun run! <laughs> Sometimes it feels like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not everyone loves them, I don't think. <laughs> well, Melissa, your, uh, your character is interesting in, in that she's kind of wedged between the, uh, these two other women who are really kind of out there, uh, and she's a little bit more buttoned down. How, how was it like to play that? And then, I mean, we know now that when, her, when she's drinking, she has a darker side. <laughs> right, yeah. She's, uh, she falls more in line with Rosa and Gina when she's drinking. Um, what was the question? How, how was it like? <laughs> how much barbecue last night? No. Uh, I had a lot of a barbecue, lot, yeah. and it's all hitting me right now. <laughs> Just kidding. So how, was, how was it to play her when you, her character is kind of more buttoned down, and you're wedged between these other two? What's it like from, from that perspective? It's super fun. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think one of the most fun are... Yeah, there's a, there's a gnat. There's a, sorry. Um, I think one of the most fun things about playing Amy is, yeah, that sometimes I kind of get to be more of a straight character and, and like, especially in scenes with Gina and, you know, and, but although we, but have, we have our fun, we do. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but then she also gets to be like silly and, and goofy and, um, and more so that way with like Rosa sometimes. And, um, and she's also just like very nervous and uptight and like high energy. Um, but yeah, I just love, I love the way that they've written the women on the show. They're not just one thing. They all are layered and they all have these different dimensions and they're all funny in different ways. Um, and that just, I think, makes for interesting relationships and scenes. And I also love that they haven't written any of the women like pitted against each other right. you know like even though Gina makes fun of Amy so much it's delightful and hilarious and fun and then it ended up growing into this like weird friendship mm -hmm. um and I loved when that happened and then I love that Amy and Rosa being the two detectives on the squad are actually friends and have each other's back and had that little journey like finding that more so for Amy but um yeah, it's just, you're, you're so used to seeing women sort of like competing with each other, or like up against each other, and we don't do that on our show, and I kind of love that. Right, and now as we saw in the, here in the finale, it's sort of morphing into now you have a thing with Jake, you're gonna, this relationship's moving forward. Mm -hmm. how, how's that as far as like going into more of like a relationship mode, and, and uh, how, how's that with Andy? <laughs> Dope. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Yeah, there was, as they were like progressing the relationship in season two, there was nervousness for me personally of like, how are they gonna do it? Like now this feels like this is gonna happen. I don't know if it's gonna happen at the in the finale or if they're gonna save it for season three. And when I read it, I just thought it was great um, and very organic the way that they <laughs> come to that real kiss um, because they're both so upset about their mentor. Um, and but yeah, I mean, Andy's a wonderful human being and a super talented dude, and um, I have a blast working with him. Didn't um, you guys eat wings before your kiss? Yeah, and like, <laughs> just roasted garlic. <laughs> just had a little competition who could get the most stank breath. That's the kind of relationship we have. And, and Magical. Uh, Chelsea, your character was who we were talking about, where she was just sort of there and then but she has, as you mentioned, she has sort of blossomed that's more than just throwing out one-liners now. And how much is that uh, your influence and how much is that Dan or you? I mean, that's theirs. <clears throat> they, they're so good and I saw it at Parks and Rec a lot uh, at filling out characters and, and having them develop different facets to their personality. <clears throat> oh, God. <laughs> she gets really choked up about this. Um, <laughs> and it's just <laughs> Do, beautiful go, growth. Yes. Um, no, so I mean, it would be funny. It's like you'd just be sort of like, oh, I hope my character like isn't just doing, you know, isn't seeming mean or isn't seeming like she doesn't care about her job at all. And then there'd be a script that comes right in that's like showing she is fiscally responsible and helping Jake or is showing that her that she really cares about what Captain Holt thinks about her. Or even like, you know, I, you know, there's times where it's like, I don't want to feel like an island and then they'll develop our friendship. And it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of like they have... Uh, uh, such a sixth sense about who's dead. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, it, was a, it was a movie reference that just came to me. But um, 
they really know when to when to deepen things and and they're so good at moving around throughout the cast and and dividing that up there's so much written now about television shows immediately after every episode that I think there's so there's there is just like a kind of a lack of patience and I think as a result like it was always our intention for Gina to be a well-rounded character but I think that you know, it, with, we have a lot of characters, and I think it takes time, it just takes time to fill everyone out and to give everyone a story that kind of shows how dimensionalized they can be. Um, and I think, the, to me, the, the sort of turning point story for it was um, when, when Gina hires the uh, IT guy. Do you remember that story? Mm-hmm. And, um, good. <laughs> Because otherwise your brain would be broken. Yeah, no. Because you were in it. And we're worried about our brains. <laughs> we're worried that our brains aren't working. Um, <clears throat> but the, and another key thing to it, and this was Mike Schur's pitch, was that uh, that Captain Holt really believed in her. And Captain Holt is such in such a position of authority that when he says to Terry, I think, you know, I trust her, listen to her, and then in the end she's right, and we had this kind of funny journey to show that she was right, uh, I think that really sort of helped. It's like an imprimatur. And Captain Holt, I don't know if you experience this, but I feel like my character sees, well, of course you do, (laughs) sees him as a father figure. And like, there's something about acting with him where you feel like he brings out like a certain vulnerability in me. Like when I'm with him, I don't feel like as, I don't know, it's interesting. So it's, it's like, I like to use that to just feel like I want him to, you know, I want him to be happy with what I'm doing, even if at times (laughs) it doesn't appear that way. And, and as we talk about these roles, how, how are you writing for them specifically as actresses? Like how? Yeah. I, have like a, I have a wig that looks oh. like Melissa's. <laughs> <laughs> and I wear like a dress that looks vaguely. It's like Castaway. Um, well, <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer that question, I guess. Well, are, let's put it this way. Are there other uh, actors in the cast where you're like, are, is there personalities influencing how you're writing their characters as, it, as you evolve into second and third seasons? You mean their human personalities as opposed to their character personalities? Uh, their human personalities, yes. Um, I don't care about them as people. <laughs> <laughs> they are puppets. <laughs> and if Google could develop some kind of animatron that, I could, that could say my goddamn words and not call them garbage, <laughs> then so help me God I would replace them. <laughs> no, um, the... The way, uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, we're not monsters, so interacting with them, you can't help but take some of that in, internalize some of that. We already lost two people. <laughs> oh. Hi. It's crazy, man. This yes, we're walking Tough up. game, tough yeah. game. Yeah, tough game. <laughs> yeah. Austin's tough, man. Austin's tough. I thought this was going well. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so, so their personalities are definitely a part of it. And also, we have a really great writer's room, and all of the writers, um, you know, have opinions and stuff, and, and things get bandied about, and then at the end of the day, hopefully you have stuff in their voice. I mean, it's funny, it's like when we do a final pass, and I'll sit at the keyboard, and I'm typing, and like exactly, you, exactly like, like that. that, but I'll do every, everyone's voice. I don't think I really do the lady's voice, but I'll do like a yeah. horrible Terry impression, and then I'll do like a Captain Holt impression. You know, it's, like you can't help it. I think every writer's room is like that. Well, it's, um, you know, it's interesting because when you, now that we're heading into the third season and, and you- Oh my God. What the <laughs> hell, ladies? I'm sorry. Come on. Hey. What, what was it? <laughs> 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 yeah, that's yeah. Um, no one's gonna want to do that again. You might as well have walked down front. <laughs> but can you just give us one piece of constructive feedback? <laughs> do you have notes? But uh, of what? Of, of, of people what? you love more. <laughs> Oh my goodness! No, Thank no, no, you. No, we appreciate We're it. Thank you. We're 100 percent joking. We, 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 they deserve a round of applause. Yes. Thank you for leaving. Any <laughs> younger? If anyone else leaves, you get that treatment. <laughs> no one's gonna leave. Trust me. Uh, that's kind of nice. They were here for an hour. How? Yeah. No. That's. Yeah. That is uh, nice. We're lining oh, up. No. <laughs> 
But it, as we, you know, as you look at, you're going into the third season now, and as you talked briefly about, Dan, how the shows kind of evolve and they get, uh, you know, personalities grow. It was very true on Parks, how all the, I don't want to say smaller players, but their roles developed. But you can look at a show, and you guys saw this, where you see people like Scully and Hitchcock, which, which if you, not to be critical, but if, they're kind of the bottom rung of the actors who get lines. I'm going to tell them you said that. Okay, good. <laughs> I mean, whoa! But don't you feel like, oh, I don't want to interrupt. No, but, that's, but that, I think that's good, though, because whereas they were just sort of early on byproducts, now they all have, like, they have personalities. They're, we You're saying them. they've climbed out of the muck and pulled themselves up into the bottom <laughs> most rung. I'm, no, look, I love them. I think they're amazing. Fun. They're so yeah. funny. And I have to say, like, a temptation and a shortcut in the writer's room is just to give them every joke. Right. Because they're, jo they're joke machines and they're joke characters. And even as human beings in real life, they're kind of jokes. I'm kidding. They're wonderful people. Really <laughs> I'm going to well tell him you said that, Dan. Yeah. He said it. Um, no. But the thing is, like, you know, and I think over time we will definitely continue to develop their characters and you'll see storylines with them. Like, we did a storyline, we did a couple of storylines with them where they weren't just sort of sitting in the background. We have this kind of dream that this season they have um, like a blood feud develops between the two of them. <laughs> it's just we have a lot of characters and so it's very difficult to give, it's already difficult to give everybody enough time. But that's, and that's kind of what we're getting at. If you look at the organic nature of it and how it goes, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of as a fan, as you're watching it, and certainly as a critic, and I'm looking at it, you, it's nice to know that people were kind of get fleshed out. And like, you start to see little trends, like, and I don't know if this is even true, but it seemed to me as I was starting to watch the season that everybody kept giving Scully just that, the yes line. Like, he just says yes to certain things in a really creepy way. Oh, uh, yeah. So like that was Hitchcock, thing. I think. Hitchcock. Hitchcock, Hitchcock right, right, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, they, we take a lot of stuff that they do. They are the hardest working actors in show business. Like, in every show. Too late for this. <laughs> you guys already insulted them. <laughs> um, no. But, like, if you go back to season one and buy the DVDs, which I would. <laughs> buy them for your friends. It's wonderful stocking stuffer. Fits right in. Um, anyway, but if you were to buy it, whatever, and watch them, if you were to pause on any given frame in the bullpen, you'll see them doing something ludicrous in the background. Like they're darning socks. There was a whole saga of Scully's feet in the first season. At one point, Hitchcock is like rubbing bunions off of them and like they're darning socks and then he's got his, uh, Scully's got his feet in a pool of water, like a little tub. Foot bath. Foot bath, oops. It's all right, it's okay. It's okay. Someone right. from Google will come get that. <laughs> Did you they, guys? Go ahead. No. They bring in like their own props. They think of ideas of stuff they want to do. They'll be building things. They're always like in deep into a world. And I have to say, like when I watch the show, they crack me up so hard. Like I love the whole confidence like a loser with confidence is so such a good comedy game like when they're just like trying to get Captain Holden on their pyramid scheme or whatever it was the boat thing and they're just like, it's just like it's so funny to me like the kind of swagger that they have is always makes me laugh <laughs> Sorry. there's also a funny thing where like Scully Scully and Hitchcock are clearly best friends in Hitchcock's eyes, but Scully thinks that Jake is his best friend. <laughs> and on a number of occasions in a number of episodes, he'll make reference to that. And the hurt on Hitchcock's face <laughs> is so funny to me. Are you guys uh, bringing anything like that to, to the set and to your roles? Like um, Phone cases. Mm -hmm. I did select this phone case, um, hoping to upgrade to a six on Fox's dime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll right. see if it's doable. Um, I, I don't know. Have you brought in any? Melissa. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and did you both uh, just quickly audition for that act actual role you got, or would you try for something else? I initially auditioned for the part that is now Rosa. And me and Andy were like playing around in the audition. We went to elementary school together um, and we were like playing around and the, the note I got, but you never know because everyone lies to you in Hollywood, was that I didn't seem like a cop. And so then I think it, it evolved from there into Gina Linetti. Yeah. Melissa? Uh, I auditioned and, and tested for Amy. For Amy, yeah, right. From the beginning. And is there anybody else, male or female, on the set you're looking at? You're like, that's a, that's a role I would, I would have loved to have been that one. Well, I do love, like, it, it's fun, like, uh, Andy and Joe, all the buddy behavior. They get to do so much comedy, physical comedy, and, like, 
high stakes action stuff. So I guess like, you know, as a girl, you want to get to do stuff like that. Yeah, I do get a little jealous of like the action stuff that yeah. you do. You and, get to like, do action the, stuff. Great. I know, but like not as much, Dan. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying like feminism is important. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> Just so fire. I would just hate to see a pretty cop hurt herself. <laughs> I was playing it's a game. Boo! Nice. Boo! <laughs> All right, more. Dan, do you want anything else? So, yeah. You want to add on to that? No. Dan, who would you be? <laughs> Terry. <laughs> right now, my pecs are bouncing up and down. You just can't tell. <laughs> Well, I, I want to throw it out to the, to the crowd to ask questions in a minute, but I just wanted to ask one thing because, you know, one of the things that you're doing, which is not, you don't see it a lot in, in sitcoms, is you've, you're, you're making it almost not serialized, but we, we ended on a cliffhanger, right? So next year is undecided about who's going to be the captain. And so how was that in the writer's room when you're moving? And you, I'll, again, get back to, the, back to Amy and Jake getting in a relationship. You're moving all these pieces around. How is it? Uh, how is it to write something that's more serial, serialized rather than just having static characters that you put in scenes that never change? Um, it, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, as I said before, like, it's really difficult if people start becoming self-aware and maturing a lot as characters, you sort of lose their comedy conceit. You know, like if Michael Scott realized in season one that he was like trying too hard <laughs> and should just be an appropriate boss and like let people come to him, then the comedy would be gone. I mean, he, you know, and, and that is a show where people learn stuff. So I'm not trying to in any way denigrate that show. But um, so that's the one hand that that is difficult. And on the other hand, serialized stuff is a little bit easier because one story leads to another story like we know now that in the premiere, we have to introduce a new captain and we have to deal with Jake and Amy. <clears throat> so like that aspect of it as a writer is really nice. Like it's very tempting to do an arc where it's like they're gonna bust, you know, the Giovese crime syndicate and it's like an eight step thing. Yeah, the, uh, the, the Austin, Austin crowd, amazing TV fans. So let's give, let's give them a chance to ask some questions. Who's have you it? cast uh, the new captain yet? Um, we have not cast the new captain yet. It's Phil Jackson, the basketball coach. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for the exception of like Elaine from Seinfeld and Mary Tyler Moore, how do you feel about the trope of women always getting pregnant at like the end of series? Hopefully we're not at the end of our series. Well, no, but I just want to know what your thoughts are about that. My th thoughts or well, everyone's thoughts? Everyone's You're probably more thoughts, thoughts. Cause Gina, you know. And, and Chelsea's thoughts. Uh, my thoughts, I don't know. Uh, I understand why they do it. They do it because it's a big plot move. I mean, like, it, it, like just from a perspective of being in a writer's room and like often at the end of a series, you've gotten your two leads together. So there isn't a move on that in that department, and, and uh, so that is, from that perspective, I think a, a, like a very sensible thing. Personally, I don't think, I'm, I, we have a lot of talk about this in the room, because there are people who will pitch, for instance, that Holt and Kevin, like, should they think about having kids? And my feeling is like, they have thought about it and they've decided not to. And like, I, and that's not because they're men at all, it's, it's actually in response to that sort of almost heteronormative idea that like for happiness to happen, a couple has to have kids. And so I could see some, like Terry just had another kid. The reason we're having Terry, or is gonna have another kid, you know, his wife got pregnant on the, on the show. We're doing that so we can put a stress on Terry's life and that'll lead to him being up all night and coming in and being stressed. So we're trying to use it as a comedy thing as opposed to like, like an end point that the series is leading to. So in answer to your question, I won't talk about other series, but I don't think that that is a necessary endpoint of a series. Does that? I will talk about other series. Best finale, Six Feet Under, and Roseanne. Did any, just kidding. 
<laughs> just kidding about Roseanne. But um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of things that have ended with pregnancy. Like, what else did aside from, um, you know, 16 and pregnant? <laughs> I was writing the title. Yeah. Yeah, that was a spoiler. It started. it started. Spoiler. I thought I was just going to see some 16-year-olds till I got to Anne pregnant. <laughs> then I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not that familiar with that as a trope, I guess. But then I kind of keep to myself. <laughs> I think I have a better answer. I think that you should do what's true to the character. So, like, I think that there are characters for whom that seems like what they want, and it seems like a good goal. And if, if the idea of your series finale is to give the characters what they want, which is what some shows do, especially in comedies, and that feels like the thing that they want, I think or that's good. Or turn it on its head, Jake gets pregnant. Done. That's our final that's what, end game. Yeah. No, but I think it's bad if it's forced on a, uh, if you have a couple and it doesn't seem like that's the thing that they want, then that seems forced in some capacity. You keep frowning. I feel like I, I know. Just want, what do we want? I want you to walk smile. out. Walk out. <laughs> I don't Tell know. us what to say. What are you looking for? I just feel like that. There's just no escape for female characters from breeding. Yes. <laughs> well, listen. I will say a lot of stuff I've read that's parts for women. It's always like they're defined by like she has one kid, she has two kids, she has three kids, she has a boyfriend, she has a husband. It's always about She's a young their mom. She's an older. Yeah. Mom. It's yeah. their relationship yeah. to a man or to a child is like the full character exactly. description. And it sucks. It does. <laughs> but I feel like we have more going on. <laughs> you know? Like, Obviously. And I yeah. hope so. I hope and so I, too. <laughs> We're all pregnant this season now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> is that bad? You're not going to uh, watch. Or does that like balance it out if we're all pregnant? Yeah. Then it's like I a little more weird. Yeah. Cancel each other out. <laughs> <Yeah>. Totally. <laughs> Do we have time for one more? I think just one more. Okay. Hi, this is uh, mostly for Dan, but mainly for the whole panel. You were talking about impressions earlier. <laughs> Not sure you know what's Trying to do the math. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about impressions earlier. Uh, how did you do an impersonation of Andre Brower's take of Velvet Thunder, and has the rest of the panel tried that? Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm destined to bomb if I yeah. try to imitate him. But uh, let's just say I did it exactly the way he did it later. Can we take one more question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I can't. I won't do it justice. I feel like we're letting everyone down. But like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Melissa, My, take it home. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Could I just do Jim Carrey and Ace Ventura instead? <laughs> no, 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 I couldn't. I couldn't. All right, everybody, thank you for coming out for this panel and just give it up. Thank you. Thank you.